of co-works. Thank you, Mr. Siddharth, for joining us. Mr. Virvani will be with us in a moment. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for that introduction. So I think firstly, um, we would like to just understand for those of, for those who do not know you, um, could you just give us a brief overview of maybe your journey and your life, where you were brought up and how your college and what, how, what your company does right now? We can't hear you, Mr. Manda. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, in spite of us being on uh, video calls for the last few months, we're still getting used to having to unmute ourselves. So uh, yeah, so I was, I was born uh, and raised in, in Bangalore. Uh, went to, to school in Malayalati, then did my undergraduate in uh, Boston at Bentley University. I uh, was there for about four years. So my family has been in the real estate business. I'm the fourth generation in real estate. So you could almost say that real estate sort of runs in my veins. Uh, and uh, you know, always had a passion for technology. So when I, uh, after graduating from uh, Bentley, I came back to Bangalore, started working with the family in different parts of the business. Uh, you know, in real estate, there's multiple asset classes. Uh, so you have residential, you have commercial, office, retail, hotels. So, so uh, essentially, got a lot of exposure into the way the business works across different asset classes, and uh, you know. One of the things I kept doing because I had these two passions, one being real estate, the other being technology, uh, you know, I'd often compare the two. I'd often compare businesses uh, from the tech I'd often compare technology businesses to real estate businesses, compare how the cultures were different, compare how they would operate uh, and compare how they'd serve customers. So uh, the idea for course came about when actually I was, I was comparing how technology businesses and, you know, at the time when I, I graduated about 2000, 11. So SaaS businesses, that software as a service, they were starting to gain a lot of traction. Uh, and the beauty of a SaaS business is that A, there's no upfront cost for the customer. And uh, B, you, you can actually scale up and down the number of users that are using the service, just like say a, a service like Microsoft Teams. Uh, you can scale up and down based on need. And I always wondered why real estate can't do the same thing. You know, real estate is so physically defined. Why can't it scale up and down Based on the needs of its of uh, of the customer, uh, and you know, I, according to me, that's just a far better way to serve the customer because uh, in the last ten years, when I would observe real estate, you'd see a lot of large corporates or large companies that would occupy a lot of office space, uh, and you know, they take just they take slightly more than what they needed based on the current size of their workforce, uh, but they the physical space doesn't really scale it scale up and down like a SaaS product. So Coworks was formed to essentially solve that problem. Uh, we're a flexible office space operator. We operate in five cities. Uh, we have about 25,000 different members that are our customers uh, and predominantly focused today on large enterprises or Fortune 500 companies, uh, the likes of HSBC, WhatsApp, uh, you know, Record Benkheiser, Walmart, uh, Flipkart, they're all of our customers. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I think it was uh, over over this journey, we realized that this is a great solution, not only for large enterprises, but also to be able to serve the SME and startup segment. As a result of which today we're able to serve a customer that needs office space anywhere from one desk uh, all the way up to 10,000 desks. Uh, and anybody that needs space anywhere from one hour all the way up to 10 years in terms of the commitment term. So yeah, that's the business in a nutshell. So I think that's that's really insightful. I think moving like to a follow up question to that. So obviously you are, as you stated, you are real estate is in your blood, so you do have that in your family. So you you did take the call to start your own venture, obviously, and Mark, and I think that's uh, truly inspirational. What were your motivations to do this? And did you have any lessons for any of the students if they want to do something in this sense? Um, what were the key lessons you learned in this journey? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's a good question. Um, first, I have to say that, you know, personally, I don't think I would have had the motivation to start something unless there was a problem to really be solved. And, you know, every business or every startup is essentially a solution to a problem. And in, at least what I've seen is there's two approaches to this, this problem statement, right? One is that uh, you have somebody that personally experiences the problem and it 
annoys or affects them so much that they believe there should be a business to solve this need. And, uh, you know, therefore, and you know, that's how maybe Uber was created or Flipkart was created or so many different businesses we've seen. It was, you, you hear every founder say the same thing. It's that they had this problem that they faced themselves and, uh, you know, they believe there should be a solution for it. There wasn't an existing solution, so they went out and created one. Uh, and the second is, uh, you know, where you have someone who sees a problem, they may not experience it themselves, but they th think that the problem is large enough that a business should be built around it. And for me, it was actually a combination of the two. I didn't personally experience, uh, you know, not being an occupier of office space, but a provider of office space. I couldn't personally relate to all of the challenges that an occupier of office space would have. But, you know, for me, it was I saw that as an opportunity uh, and hence went after it. But I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs make the mistake of either going after uh, a, something that isn't really a problem and therefore it's easy to start, but it's difficult to scale. And similarly, I've seen some that, uh, you know, would go after a problem that isn't large enough and then there's maybe a lot of people going after it, but there isn't uh, sufficient depth in the market for everyone to survive in that. So, you know, I think it's uh, what I, for me, one of the best pieces of advice that I received was make sure you're going after a problem that's large enough such that if you have competition in the market, uh, you know, everyone will survive and everyone will do one and everyone will be profitable in that. Oh, great. I think we have Karan here as well. Yeah, that's great. So um, we do have Mr. Virvani with us. So um, just a brief introduction about Mr. Virvani. So I did introduce and um, so obviously today the plan is that we're going to be having a in a sense of a friendly face off. So Mr. Virvani, Mr. Virvani, Mr. Virvani is yeah. the CEO of WeWork India. So um, and both of these um, men are actually they are working in very similar business industry in the same business industry and are competitors, but are also great friends. So I think that's really remarkable. Mr. Virvani, is it? Um, can you give us just a brief introduction about yourself and your journey in um, throughout um, your life and uh, your uh, company right now? Sure. Um, firstly, thank you guys for having me and I'm sorry about these technical difficulties. It always you know, tends to happen. Um, just a quick brief about myself. You know, I'm born and brought brought up and bred in, in Bangalore. Uh, went to school here, um, you know, spent half of my school life in Vidya Shilp, the other half in, in Malia Aditi. Um, from there, went to the UK to study business uh, administration. So very you know, straightforward kind of like schooling um, and, uh, you know, got out or actually during college, um, you know, felt like I wanted to start something of my own um, and actually ended up setting up a hospitality business. So, you know, some of you guys hopefully have eaten there at Sanchez and Sriracha and UB City. And now we have a few more restaurants uh, around the city. Um, and, um, you know, from there spent uh, some time actually then working in the family business uh, and spending time with my with my dad trying to learn as much as possible uh, and I think that's vital when you're first starting out your career to have you know one a strong mentor uh, but also just to like be humble enough to like just learn and not get too excited to try to you know be involved too early on um, and that learning was so valuable that it gave me the confidence um, you know to try to uh, uh, create my own path or at least you know try something different from just the traditional business that we have um, currently and um, and that's when uh, you know the opportunity of WeWork came about um, and the reason WeWork you know connected with me I think so much was because of that time that I spent trying to start up a business or set up a business in India and you know work with creatives and you know other entrepreneurs and things like that there was no infrastructure and there was you know it was hard even for someone one with with my kind of um, foundation or backing to even do that um, so it could only be you know that much harder for, for you know everyone else and we wanted to try to see how we can contribute to you know the startup ecosystem and and you know help businesses in India um, connect and actually like go global as well um, and so for the last three years that's what I've been doing um, you know scaling we work in India and it's been a crazy ride um, and excited for the for the future. OK, great. Thank you so much for that introduction. So we'll just move on to the next question. So now we'll uh, ask you guys a question and um, we'll go in turns as to who's like answer like each of you will answer the questions respectively. 
So the next question we have is um, obviously the COVID-19 pandemic has made everything on online. We would obviously love to have you in school in person, but we've had to do this online. So um, in the sense of your business, obviously it has affected a lot of businesses, but in, in terms of real, the real estate industry and your uh, company itself, how exactly has it affected um, your company? Uh, Mr. Vervani, you can go first. Sure. So, um, you know, two sides of it, I think on the traditional business, which is, you know, the embassy group uh, and that commercial side of things, uh, the business is pretty steady because these are long term, you know, blue chip companies with long term leases that occupy a lot of our spaces. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these guys have given us commitment for, you know, nine years, 10 years uh, or even longer. And so, uh, you know, that doesn't really get impacted as much during, you know, the uh, some Something like Corona, which is a few months because there's contractual obligations from uh, these companies. And even from a cost standpoint, a lot of these companies, you know, ha have a view of their cash flow. They can sustain blips that uh, like this that happen in the market. Um, you know, obviously on the WeWork side, uh, although we do have a big percentage of these enterprise companies, just the nature of the business is more flexible. Uh, you also have a lot of smaller businesses that, you know, have been heavily impacted by uh, the lockdowns and also Corona and just the slow economic environment. Um, so I think in the medium term, we're definitely seeing, uh, you know, some of the members sort of uh, maybe leaving uh, or at least saying that, look, I'll come back once, you know, this thing is over and we can start getting back to the office. Um, so in the meet in this short term, you know, we're just managing that situation, trying to like make sure that we work with our members to be more as partners rather than, you know, a landlord or someone, you know, demanding rent. Um, we're trying to work with them and see how we can be partners in growing you know, helping them shrink and then grow again in the future. Um, but I think in, you know, in the long term or medium to long term, the biggest uptick in commercial real estate is actually going to come to the flexible space providers, which is very much, you know, what, um, you know, Coworks and WeWork does uh, because the need for flexibility, the need for, uh, you know, safe space, uh, uh, a very clean space and an operator that knows how to actually operate the office space and even deal with, you know, you know, God forbid another situation like this, right? Um, you don't as a company now want to be even thinking about doing that if your company is actually building technology or or something like that. You'd much rather give it a, in the hands of someone who knows exactly what they're doing. Um, also, you're going to see that you know more people are working from home or remote working is definitely picking up, but the work from home thing doesn't actually you know really work there's infrastructure issues there's um you know small apartments uh, and uh, it's not as easy to sustain over you know a period of a year maybe for a few months you can but but definitely not for a year and so work near home or needing an office you know close to your home a meeting room a place to collaborate to have that human connection that you know we all sort of long for um is definitely going to remain and is is still going to be there so you know we see that and we're you know waiting for the time that, that you know we open things up because we know the kind of demand we're going to get is you know going to be incredible and and uh, we're just preparing for that and uh, Mr. Manda, you can go ahead now. Uh, the same thing, how has COVID essentially affected your business and like do, what do so, you see will um, happen? Yeah, so, you know, I think Karan mentioned a lot of the most relevant and valid points. Uh, and, you know, I think as he mentioned, it applies to not only both of our businesses, but everyone in our industry and just generally to everyone that is an office space provider of any form, right? Uh, you know, I just, I think I'd add that as humans, we are social beings. We, you know, we thrive on the connections we have with the people we're surrounded by, with our colleagues. Uh, and, you know, if if it's one thing that this the pandemic has validated for us, it's that, uh, you know, we can't be so disconnected. We're not wired to be so disconnected. And that, you know, when you're in a physical workplace with your colleagues, that's where culture is formed. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, I would say almost impossible to emulate that culture online. Uh, and uh, yeah, also, I think as Karan said, we're not geared for work from home. Both of us had technical difficulties getting onto this call. So that's validation right there. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think we 
just because of our dependence on uh, on the so- those social interactions with other people, we are also going to be so dependent on coming into work. Uh, it's also a place for us to focus, a place for us to escape. So, you know, we think that the workplace is going to continue to be important and all of the press about how different businesses are going to move to, let's say, 25 percent of their workforce or 50 percent of the workforce moving to work from home. We think, uh, you know, that that is uh, at least personally, I think that that's it's good for the press in the short term, but we don't think it's going to that messaging is going to sustain in the long term. Uh, because uh, you know every business has realized that it's that uh, the workplace and connection is Im- important, and you know at the end of the day, workplaces we're all just not you know cogs in a machine. We need to collaborate to get work done. So uh, that that you know speaks for speaks to the bright future the flexible workspace will have. Uh, I think personally, the one thing uh, that was very evident during this lockdown is that uh, it's it's been a difficult time for the flexible workspace industry because I think, as Karan said, customers, some customers at least, of the smaller, the startups, the SMEs, they have a view that you know we we rather sort of disengage with uh, from our office space and then take up office space again once we need it when we come back. Uh, so for us, uh, it's been important to rally people, to rally the teams. Uh, and you know, I think clear and effective communication with all of the different people we're working with uh, has been uh, pivotal for us to tide over this crisis to get to get people to work together. Uh, and you know, it's during this time I started to really like the comparison between businesses and sports teams. Right? When you th- when you think about it in a sports team, uh, you know, you're not going to be very successful if you don't have each person playing a very specific role and doing it to the highest level, if you don't have everybody clearly communicating, if you don't have exceptional talent at every position, if you don't have all of these fundamentals in place, you're not going to be successful for too long. And I think the same is true in business and in life, right? And, uh, you know, it it constantly rings true anytime you're faced with with any form of adversity. Okay, great. So I think um, both of you really like got the essence of the lockdown in terms of your in in terms of the real estate industry in India. So moving on to the next question. So I mean, this is a pretty broad spectrum one, but I mean, uh, startups are uh, commonly known as the most fun things to do, but also the the hardest things to execute. So um, I'm sure both of you have experienced that. So in terms of that journey, um, students, students from the grade of nine to 12 who are listening do face some of the similar challenges and in terms of purpose and focus, which is something that you could uh, relay out to them. So what lessons from your uh, life and your professional journey uh, do you want to share with us that could possibly benefit them? So um, Mr. Uh, Virwani, if you could go first. Um, You know, I think uh, Seth touched on it earlier. Um, You know, firstly, you should just love what you do. Right. Um, I think like working at a startup is always fun. Uh, one, if you love the thing that you're doing and also if you believe in that mission uh, or the direction that that company is taking, uh, taking. And I think when you know any of you start your first job uh, or go to a first company, I think that's the thing that you should really think about the most rather than, you know, how much you're going to get paid or uh, how cool the office is or whatever it is. It's, it's mostly about, you know, do you believe in that mission? Uh, because like like you know the time today, um, only if you actually are truly passionate about it um, and actually believe in the mission that when things are looking down, you will continue to give you know your hundred um, percent in into that company or to that mission uh, to make sure that we come out of the other side and and that's you know uh, a big part about uh, building a startup as well and actually being in the office and sharing those experiences with you know your colleagues um, through the journey that actually makes the team you know extremely strong. Um, you know, from a from a someone in school perspective, um, the the kind of advice that I will give you is that um, a lot of times in school, uh, just as in business, uh, you know, people make you think that the the thing coming up or like you know whatever's ahead, whether that's an exam or whatever it is, is probably like the biggest thing in your life, and it's going to be like the end of your life if you don't, you know, sort of succeed at it. Uh, but actually. 
that's not true. You will fail many times. You will, you know, uh, probably give your hundred percent and not get where you wanted to get. A lot of times while building a business and also while at school. Uh, but the whole idea is to make sure that you know that mission or whatever you really need to achieve your goal, the end goal of where you guys want to go to college or whatever it is, continues to be there. And you know you kind of keep working towards that and if if it is something that you really really want you'll you'll definitely achieve it as long as you set your mind to it you can definitely do it okay great mr manda you can go ahead yeah so uh, you know i i don't know if if uh, i found my true purpose here and i think it's a difficult question for me at least personally to answer but uh, what I will share with you guys is that, uh, you know, at least in, in my experience, uh, one of the things you learn very quickly uh, when you start a business is uh, how to start thinking about the impact of your business decisions in the short term and in the long term. Uh, and, you know, sometimes personally as well as on the business front. Uh, and you start to rationalize risk taking also over the course of time, you start to understand how to uh, price risk, uh, how to understand the implications of those decisions. So, um, you know, and with a business, essentially sometimes everything's at stake, right? You, if if uh, your livelihood is at stake in some case, if, if things don't go well. So that's one reason for you, any, any entrepreneur to have that added motivation to sort of give it your all. Uh, and then there's also that's a you could maybe say that's an extrinsic or external motivation and there's also an internal motivation which comes from the fact that you know the business is your baby you craft it you you define the journey uh, and uh, very often you have some level of clarity about where you want to go right and uh, it's not often that in life at least at such a young age you know when I was in school I had no clue what the rest of my life looked like but when you start uh, you you kind of set that end goal. You set the mile marker that you're running after, and you you give it your all. And uh, you know while and and when you find the thing that uh, you're most passionate about, you're willing to give it that all. So it's uh, very similar to I think what uh, Karan said. If you love if you love what you're doing, then you'd be willing to give it your all. If it's your baby, you'll be willing to give it your all. Uh, and you know the other thing is I think um, there's as you start to, you know, once you graduate from college, you start, you realize you have these added responsibilities. Now you have obligations to your family, friends, uh, your loved ones, everyone that you're surrounded by. So the other thing I think is one of the hardest parts is is allocating time. You know, there's only 24 hours in a day and I'm not saying sleep less, but, uh, you know, you have to choose how you allocate that time. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I often find myself wasting time on things that, maybe aren't adding value. Time spent with family or friends, that's important. So I'm not saying make make trade-offs, but uh, you know, there's only so much time you have. What you do at that time, how much time you spend learning every single day, uh, I think that's really important. And that's going to define the trajectory of your life. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I think I learned that the hard way. Uh, in, in school, uh, maybe I didn't get involved enough, uh, didn't network enough. Uh, and you know, just maybe it was sort of unilateral, only focused on maybe grades and nothing else. Didn't say I was brilliant in school, but I'm just saying it wasn't. I didn't look at other metrics or define it in many other ways. But uh, you know, you st you start to realize that it, that there's definitely a lot more to it. And uh, the more you get involved, the more perspectives and ideas you gain. And that's really important for uh, to shape how you view the world. And uh, you know, it, it takes you a long way. So definitely get involved. Uh, definitely learn from other people's ideas, read a lot. That's also learning from people's ideas. Uh, so yeah. So that's great. I think you dove into the second, uh, the last question as well. So um, if you have, Mr. Manda, if you have any other, so the next one is that if you have any words of advice or any key takeaways that you would possibly probably change if you were in high school. So like you said that um, probably that exams aren't the be all and end all, but also to, uh, engage yourself in a holistic life. So I think we said something dangerous. I'm just, I'm not sure, but you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I know that makes sense. But um, <laughs> no, do, you, I don't know. Is, uh, do you have any key takeaways? Um, any other key takeaways or advice that you have for the students of grade nine to twelve? Yeah, so you know, I'm I'm gonna. Sh uh, I had the opportunity of listening to Travis Kalanick right about the time that we were starting CoWorks. 
uh, he was uh, talking at a conference uh, in New Delhi, and I was I had the opportunity to listen to him there in person. Uh, and you know, he shared his story, and he said that when he uh, Travis Kalanick, by the way, is the founder of Uber, and when he was starting Uber, and he had this idea, uh, he started to pitch the idea for Uber to investors, and he didn't get rejected, you know, once, twice, ten times. He got rejected four hundred times, over four hundred times. So he had to hear more than four hundred no's before he got one yes. Uh, and had he given up today, Uber would not have existed. Uh, you know, today we take for granted the fact that you can pull your smartphone out, press a button and a uh, cab appears. Uh, but if he had given up our world, actually our lives would have, and the way we commute would have been very different today. Uh, so, you know, perseverance uh, at the end of the day, if, if you don't have perseverance, then, you know, everything else sometimes takes a back seat. And that's so important to be able to, again, give it your all and plow through everything. So you know, don't give up, guys. If you have that thing that that you're passionate about, you know, definitely give it your all. It's going to reward you in the future. And Mr. Vivani, do you have any like takeaways or pieces or pieces of advice? You know, I, I'll just actually feed off what what Sid just said, and and I there's this this quote from like Steve Jobs that says that you know um, everything around you that exists was actually created by people that are you know not that much smarter than you, and if you actually want to change something, uh, you know, and you think there's a better way of doing it, you can actually go and change that uh, and you know persevere and actually like change it and you know when we were starting we work or even at, at early early days when you know co-works actually was started before we work was no one really like even thought about um you know when i used to go meet like these huge landlords that have you know have built offices for many many years and tell them that we wanted to you know change the way the office was and there's going to be like startups and there's you know it's going to be like this whole vibrant place and not just like dead desks all over it um, a lot of people uh, a lot of them kind of like looked at me and I used to just go in my you know like black t-shirt and jeans and and uh, have these meetings and you know a lot of people didn't really believe it um, until we actually just went and did it and you know kind of pushed through and did what we needed to do and today when you look at the commercial office space environment in India or even around the world it's completely changed um, right, uh, where you have the biggest companies in the world now looking at us and now you have then landlords, uh, the same landlords that, you know, we went and spoke to earlier saying that why don't you take more space or, you know, why don't you grow with us and things like that. So you can change and if you put your mind to it, you can actually build or do whatever you want to do and you should just go and do it and don't listen to anyone else. OK, great. Those are some wise words. So I think next and uh, now I'll just hand it over to Krishna, who's going to ask you a few questions that we have in our Q&A section for the next um, 15 minutes or so. So Krishna, you can take over. Thank you so much, uh, Rohan. Uh, so Mr. Manda and Mr. Virvani, we've just got a bit a few questions. So Mr. Virvani, if you don't mind going first, uh, the first question. As you both are competitors in the co-working field, how do you make sure that you are staying on top of things and how do you stay ahead of the competition? Um, you know, so for the for the most part, we actually just try to focus around building the best possible product and providing the best possible experience to um, our members uh, and uh, you know uh, stay true to our mission and we have you know something that we're trying to build and most of our time I would say 95 97 percent of the time really just goes in focusing on that and not so much about what's happening you know in the competitive world but um, what we do do is we learn a lot from our competitors we're always watching you know how different companies are trying new things different models how did this guy how was he able to like get this deal and we weren't able to get this deal or whatever it is and you take those things in your stride and actually try to learn and sort of like better yourself um you know in our industry over the last three years i think there's about 300 or 400 other operators of different sizes in different parts of the country so there's you know enough and enough competition um, but I think if you just kind of focus on building your product and giving your best uh, and making sure that the standard of what you put out is going to be something that you would buy uh, or you ex expect for yourself. 
Um, that's where we spend most of our time. So we learn from competition and competition keeps us going and keeps us motivated. Um, but really 90, 90% of the time is just focus on, you know, like executing, focus on innovating um, and focusing on on just delivering the promise that we've that we've put forward. Yeah, thank you uh, so much, uh, Mr. Vivani. Mr. Menda, oh, how have you uh, been working in this field and how do you stay ahead of the competition? So, you know, I, I think uh, similar to what Karan said, I mean, we, we don't focus as much on competition. Uh, you know, we definitely learn from them, but focus, I think we spend a lot more of our energy focusing on customers, right? Uh, speaking to customers, understanding their needs, understanding how needs are changing and not like only at a macro level, but the smaller nuances of how their needs are changing. And to do our best to serve those needs in the best possible way. Uh, I think the thing that keeps us going uh, and it's true of any business, but also true of all of us as people is that you're constantly going to iterate, you're going to constantly going to evolve and constantly going to keep getting better. And uh, sometimes it's, you find that if you focus too much of your energy on competition, then, you know, it's just sort of two dogs chasing each other's tail or, you know, and, you know, I think as Karan said, there's there's 400 competitors in the industry. There's, you know, there's that's never going to take us anywhere. Focusing on the customer uh, and constantly iterating our products and services, constantly iterating our approach, our strategies, our people uh, to be able to best serve the customers. I think that is to me, a winning strategy. Uh, and, uh, you know, that it means that you often identify new opportunities from that. You're able to create new products and services just by listening to customers. Uh, and, you know, that's the best strategy to stay ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for your insightful words, uh, Mr. Menda. And uh, just to kind of carry on with that concept, uh, the whole process of uh, being an entrepreneur, someone has asked, uh, I'm a person who comes from a family where none of my family members are entrepreneurs. How do I attain uh, like this level of motivation and get over the fear and of starting a new business and over the challenges? Um, I, can, I, I can go first. I mean, I think that if you see most of the greatest entrepreneurs never had entrepreneurs uh, and actually that you know, sometimes can be a freedom uh, in itself where, you know, like me and Sid, we come from, you know, like fathers who have built huge businesses and then there's expectations and, you know, there's also like uh, shoes to fill and all of that versus, you know, being an entrepreneur uh, on your own. It's almost like, you know, you have nothing to lose. It's like either I go for it or I don't. Um, I think I just go back to the previous thing, which is that, look, if you ha if there's a problem that you want to solve and you're like very passionate about solving that problem, um, you will go and do it um, and you should go and do it and you will have many failures. You should just learn from those failures um, because the, the actually the thing that stops people from doing stuff the most is the fear of failing. And if you just, you know, forget about the fear of failing, you can just go and try it, you know, even if it's like making a phone call to someone to try to start that journey and you're scared to make that phone call to even, you know, ask like, what will this guy think? He's such a big guy. Like, will he actually help me? Just go and make that phone call. Most of the time people are, you know, very responsive. Um, and and like I said, if you're just passionate about it, just go ahead and do it. Uh, it doesn't matter if you come from a family of entrepreneurs or you don't. If the product and the problem is big enough, people will come behind it and buy it and invest in it. And, you know, you can make it and, you know, come, people come work for you and you can just build, build from there. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for that, Mr. Virwani. And uh, now, uh, Mr. Menda, there's a question for you and about co-work. So co-working uh, relies on physical contact. How has co-works uh, been working around uh, that physical contact and the whole barrier now in these extreme circumstances? Yeah, so good question. Um, I think there's two, three things we're doing. One is uh, a lot of the businesses uh, have you know, let, let's say there's a lot of large, let's say banking and financial services businesses or technology businesses that are our customers. Um, we're working with them on solutions. So we've uh, adopted one is I think current touched upon it earlier is a distributed office model 
where you know in the past or at least up until pre covid uh, a lot of businesses would try and consolidate their entire workforce into one large headquarters uh, what we're already seeing is a lot of businesses kind of, kind of flipping that strategy on their head saying hey instead of it being one large headquarters why can't we have multiple offices that are distributed across the city or across the country and and each each employee can just visit the location that's closest to them or you know hypothetically if it's a traveling salesman they can drop into the location that's on their route uh, so you know what we've started to do is offer solutions where you're not just tied to one center and if you're a member of one center you're a member of all the centers uh, and to offer them solutions that essentially allows them the flexibility so you know every member has the app and every member has a key card they can book meeting rooms across the country the key card works across the country uh, so that's one solution and then the other is uh, you know uh, we've seen a lot of financial services companies adopt this team a team b approach which is where to encourage social distancing 50% of their workforce comes into work at in one shift and 50% of the workforce comes into work in the other shift so you know there are several different things we're doing we've uh, integrated a lot of technology that makes the workplace completely touchless so even if you go into a coffee machine instead of touching the touch screen on the coffee machine you can use your phone to get the cup of coffee or you know you don't now don't have to take out the key card anymore you can just use your app to swipe into the building uh, and you know we're close to getting to 100% of the building to be completely touchless so you're not actually touching or interacting with any other surfaces and uh, yeah you know i mean again it's a lot of these ideas while some of it comes from us some of it comes from just listening to customers and you know like i said earlier that's been a good strategy uh, and you know the last point on that on this is there's changes we can make but you you know we're cognizant of the fact that some changes aren't going to be relevant once you have a vaccine right so you know let's hypothetically a vaccine comes march april next year and you know I, I my guess is as good as any i just been using that date for everything so you know just hypothetically it comes march april next year uh, you know up until then we make changes to the office then those changes become meaningless right so let's say we we redesign all of our workspaces uh, to make it completely geared for social distancing and then after that you know every customer comes back to us and says hey you know what actually we're cost conscious we need to go back to what it was like pre covid and you know therefore all of those investments we make won't be valuable so we're trying to do it in the most low touch way possible and trying to build a lot of flexibility in the way we have furniture as well and starting to think about you know can you make supply chain changes such that you have furniture that can actually just move in and move out really quickly uh, to be able to adapt yeah i think uh, that's a very interesting uh, point to bring up that all these changes we make now how relevant will they be once there's a vaccination and, and all of that uh so just to move on to the last question we have uh, in the question and answer so um obviously i think mr vidwani and you have mentioned that there's been that whole kind of thing where businesses set up headquarters so how do you convince companies uh, that co-working is the way forward and convince them that co-working is a better alternative to the traditional system in a way do you want uh, i can i can start i just i just make their existing office and then i make them walk a we work office and and it's pretty clear you don't really need to do too much more convincing after that um uh, but but jokes apart i mean it it's you know these these companies or these um uh, these uh, real estate heads are looking for a few things right they're looking for like you know is this going to like help me cut cost or at least like be a lot more cost conscious um you know uh, when you look at the traditional space it's it's extremely rigid you're on long term leases whereas with uh, with us you can you know sign up for a month or you know 5 7 years even if you wanted um so that flexibility and you know just a different way of i think doing things um has has changed it but the most important thing is that all of these companies have put employee experience um you know so ahead of everything else as opposed to maybe 10 20 years ago uh where you're looking at the youngest you know population in the world a, a large chunk of that is working in all of these companies and they and there's a huge talent war so for for a lot of these organizations having you know a great working environment uh, not the 
office, not just being a place to come to work, but actually to be able to have, you know, social connections, to have events, um, to have happy hours, to have all of these engaging activities that keep the employees happy as well. Um, and that's stuff that we focus on and, you know, they don't really know how to do that well. Um, and with, you know, a, a combination of both financial as well as employee experience uh, being far, you know, superior to the, the traditional space, um, you know, that's a sort of like pitch that we, so, you know, give to a lot of companies. And earlier it was a lot harder, but now with, you know, flexible workspaces and co-working just so widespread around the world, it's no longer become about, you know, explaining that part of the product. It's, it's really about, um, you know, the change in mindset that they're willing to have uh, and the, the need to experiment or even, you know, try out a, a new model in terms of real estate. And with COVID, that's going to only uh, sort of accelerate and increase it once we open up, hopefully. Yeah, you know, can I just add that I think in co-working and in flexible workspace are sort of sales pitch and to answer the question it's a sales pitch is so multi-layered uh that uh, you know you can't just distill it down to okay so what is the one difference or one usb right uh and you know while flexibility and affordability is definitely up there when people spend eight to ten hours of their day in the workplace it the pitch has to and it almost ends up being so multi-layered right and uh, it's something that is you know, maybe not every business can say, uh, but I think in order to differentiate and in order to, you know, to to prove why uh, your your solution is the best, it has to be so multi-layered. And you know, I think that's why uh, co-working has seen the traction it has across the world. Uh, it's because there's there's so much value every business is getting out of adopting this new flexible way of working. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So um, I think we'd really like in spite of all the technical issues that we faced initially, I think this talk was this session interview was extremely insightful for me, myself, and even for I I'm, I'm hope that was really insightful for all our viewers as well. So we'd like to thank you, Mr. Virvani and Mr. Manda for joining us today. It was a real pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you guys for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.